American Meteorological Society's policy program is supported in part by a public-private partnership. The other thing we've had for many years as a higher standard is Minnesota, we're the land of 10,000 lakes. We've had extra lake standards for many years since uh, the early 70s. Um, our next speaker is Seal Strauss. She's the Minnesota State Floodplain Manager. She oversees the administration of the State Floodplain Management Program promoting and ensuring sound land use development in floodplain areas in order to promote the health and safety of the public, minimize loss of life, and reduce economic losses caused by flood damages. SEAL is also the vice chair of the Association of State Floodplain Managers. Thank you. Let's see. Oh, I can see it here. Good. Uh, I'm going to start off with a little bit about some of the different kind of mitigation methods that we've done in Minnesota over the past, starting with some of the, the ones we've been doing more long-term and working towards some more recent issues. But looking really long-term, back in the 1880s, this is a map of, of Minneapolis, and way back then, they were thinking very forward. They were looking at setting up park systems around the lakes, next to the rivers. Apparently, uh, biking was really big back then, and uh, so they had this nice network started. And we've continued that, and we really do have a lot of nice public space next to the lakes and, and rivers. And that really helped in terms of mitigation when we had record levels uh, in our chain of lakes here this past summer in June of 2014. And you can see in the photo there a lot of water but we basically had no structures impacted in most of Minneapolis. Further upstream in some of the suburbs we did, but in Minneapolis, it was damaged to the, some of the trails and uh, the golf course, but no structural damage. Uh, bikers and the, the, the walkers had to share for a little while. And what we did see, and, and it's something that's become a bigger issue in recent years, is landslides. This big landslide here that uh, was on, on a bluff next to uh, the Mississippi River, and it cost quite a bit to repair. And we've been having more problems with the uh, landslides statewide and with the fluvial erosion, the streams m basically moving during floods, a couple hundred feet even. So that's a real challenge that we're still working with, trying to deal with. Uh, and this was going on just weeks before we hosted the, uh, the All-Star baseball game. And I'll bet you nobody there knew that we had just been through record floods in the city. Uh, another thing that we've been doing for many years is we've had higher standards, as many other states and communities have. This is a part of town where the, the buildings are all pretty deep in the water because it's an older part of town. The newer part of town where they were using those higher standards, you can really see the difference. They had a lot less damage. Uh, the other thing we've had for many years as a higher standard is Minnesota, we're the land of 10,000 lakes. We've had extra lake standards for many years since uh, the early 70s, and those rules have applied to the areas within 1,000 feet of the lake, 300 feet of rivers. There is a minimum elevation through that whole area. You're not stopping at that magic line where FEMA says the floodplain is on a map. It goes at full 1,000 feet. So um, we extend beyond um, that mapped area with our standards, which has been very beneficial because so many of our areas of development are on lakes. And then there's all the so related standards with those shoreland rules in terms of setbacks and vegetation removal restrictions and allowing for uh, reducing the runoff, reducing erosion, some of those kinds of things. And in fact, right now, before the state legislature, our governor's pushing for a 50-foot buffer, um, permanent vegetation buffer. That's more looking at the egg land um, along all of our state waters. So it will be interesting to see how that turns out. Uh, another program we have that uh, got authorized in 1987 was we have our own uh, flood damage reduction program and grants. 
It's a 50-50 grant program. It went for quite a few years without a lot of money, but we had a really big flood in the Red River uh, of the North there in 1997. And you can see from that graph that our legislature is really seeing the value of being proactive with um, mitigation and putting some money into it. And we've had projects all over the state, but especially in the Red River of the, um, the North area, Fargo-Moorhead, East Grand Forks, if you're familiar with some of those cities, that's the part of the state where it's flat. The floodplain is mi literally miles wide. So your 1,000 feet around uh, or 300 feet by the river didn't quite cover that floodplain. So there, there continues to be issues there. And then a couple other communities in particular where there's a lot of riverine flooding. Um, there's been a lot of good work done there. The program does uh, focus on acquisitions, especially of the willing sellers. Uh, we put a priority on the cost share for where there's federal grants. So the federal grants might be covering 75%. The state grants will cover half of the non-federal share. And then other um, projects are done just with a 50-50 um, between the state and working out something with the locals. Uh, we, there have been quite a few bigger projects that have been done. This is an example where they took the uh, levy that had been here, they moved it back, bought a lot of uh, houses out, made that um, park areas. And another program that in that flat, wide area in the Red River, we have uh, ring dikes around a lot of the uh, farmsteads, which has really saved a lot of money because uh, you know, they've, they've just the value of all the things in those bins and uh, keeping the, the farming going there in those areas. Uh, a, kind of a cool project or relationship that we've been developing over, I'd say, especially the last 15 years, is with our DOT. And what I don't have up there separately is that back in 2001, 2002, we really started improving our relationships between the DOT and the State Department of Natural Resources at the DNR, we're the regulatory guys. We, we've, we have to, you have to get a permit from us to do things with bridges and culverts and, and stuff like that in the rivers. And so one of the things we did was we streamlined things. We, we actually got um, staff people who are DNR people being paid for by DOT to help them with the projects. And, uh, also, we did a little training on, on if those of you who are familiar with letters of map revision and some of the things that's a hassle to, to do some of these projects. And um, they learned some ways to streamline that process. Though they, they, they realized the value of no rise um, certification, if anybody's familiar with that process. But basically, we, we've got a better working relationship that really benefited. Uh, the speed of when the 35W bridge fell down over the Mississippi River, it re that relationship we already had in place really helped um, get those approvals through and get that project um, done in a very timely manner. Uh, and then more recently, the DOT has really been a champion of getting better data. And I'm going to go ahead and show that. The uh, precipitation data being the Meteorological Society. I'm guessing a lot of you are familiar with uh, some of this, but the precipitation data, the TP40, uh, came out back in 1960, and our DOT helped get the funding to get that updated to the Atlas 14, which came out in 2013, had additional 50 years of data, quite a few more stations, compare it to the uh, TP40, and there's quite a difference in the state, so DOT is able to use this um, better, more accurate, updated information in the planning and design of the projects. And it is pretty, sig oops, oh, my slides kind of weird, got weird. But anyway, it's showing about a 32% increase in the Minneapolis area, a 20% increase in the Fargo-Moorhead area. So it's valuable to have that more up-to-date information and, and they worked with us on, uh, and, and the other, all the federal agencies in getting that information up to date. The other thing they've been doing is working on uh, looking at, let's see, it's Flash Flood Vulnerability and Climate Adaptation Pilot Project. I think the title kind of says it all, what they're trying to do there. 
and they, they're focused on the culverts, bridges, roads that are running near uh, floodplains, parallel to the floodplains, trying to look at those most vulnerable areas. Uh, the sens sensitivity aspects gets into how likely they are to be flooded, how deep they'd be, that kind of stuff. And then some of the other criteria they were looking at was where's the detour if this bridge is out? or um, what emergency operations wouldn't be able to occur. You know, some of those kind of safety um, things that they looked at also. And they put it into tiers and figured out uh, from the most vulnerable to the least vulnerable where the priorities are. And here's an example of one of the maps that they did. They color-coded the, the vulnerability tiers. This map we actually used when we were doing the FEMA uh, risk map action meetings, if, for those who are familiar with that mapping process. So this is something that was shared with the locals, um, the regional planning people, the county people at, at one of these mapping um, and looking at what mitigation we should be looking at meetings. Oh, yeah, I was just making it a little easier to read. Uh, but I got to say that we got to continue worrying about those maps. Boy, you know, North Carolina's got the Cadillac. I think we've got a bicycle. You know, this is showing uh, the red counties are the ones that have um, the digital flood insurance rate maps. A lot of counties you can see that don't have them. In Minnesota, um, we've got a lot of parts of the state that don't have those updated maps. And even in the parts where they are updated, uh, if they were done earlier, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see it very well, but what this is showing is that's the the floodplain boundary, and this is two-foot topo. It shows that, actually, if you were drawing the boundary with the two-foot topo even, that that would be the boundary. So we've got a lot of maps that people don't consider uh, adequate. There's a lot of work to do. I know nationally in terms of getting better quality maps out there. And we were at uh, 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 an open house here recently, uh, and the local reporter, I got to find that quote. The local reporter uh, quoted me, and I don't remember saying it quite this way, but he quoted me saying, Strauss said, people don't have as many complaints when the maps aren't wrong. Yeah, <laughs> which is true. It's a lot easier to, to, to have people have faith in those maps when they, when they make sense. And this is a viewer that's a public viewer, so anybody can go look at it in Minnesota and see their two-foot contours. We've got statewide LIDAR. Uh, and then I just wanted to end here with a little note about one of the uh, Minnesota Silver Jackets projects. We've had several very good projects. Uh, this is the St. Paul inundation maps and pointing out just how cooperative it was. That in addition to the USGS, NOAA, um, uh, core folks, you can see that we, we especially we do note the city of St. Paul was a partner and DNR was a partner in this project. And we've done a lot of other good projects through Silver Jackets. That's been a good effort. And I think that's my last one. <laughs>